In this video, I want to show you how to write a very simple reverse mode automatic differentiation engine for arbitrary compute graphs. For this, we will look at a very simple function, but which takes two inputs, which are combined in a non-trivial way. Then we're going to break it down into a compute graph and define a forward computation routine. We are going to create a library of primitive rules for automatic differentiation and then implement a VJP, including some sugar coating around it. Let's get started. The channel sponsor Pasteur Labs is currently hiring SciML and software engineering positions. Check out pasteurlabs.ai slash careers for more details. Hi and welcome to this new video in the series on automatic differentiation. If you watched one of the previous videos, you learned how to implement reverse mode AD for computational chains. So if your compute graph only consists of sequential application of operations where we don't have any complicated dependencies. However, for most applications, we are interested in using AutoDiv4. This is of course not the case. And we have arbitrary compute graphs with more complicated dependencies. This is what I want to look at in this video with a simple example in Python together with NumPy. For this, we will look at scalar mode automatic differentiation for a function that takes two inputs and produces one output. I denoted these two inputs with x0 and x1, and the compute basically is that we apply the sign to x0, we sum up the two numbers, and then we multiply the result. We can extract that into a compute graph. For this, we will use intermediary variables that I denoted with set here, and we first start by assigning input nodes, and those are the z0 and z1, we will just set them to the x0 and the x1. And now we kind of describe how the order of operations appear. This compute graph that we're going to write down explicitly is what also happens under the hood. Your computer program is traced or if you use any of the deep learning frameworks, this is how they represent the operations. Of course, they do it with arrays, matrices, vectors. Here we just do it with scalars, but they have some internal representation of that. Could look differently, but conceptually very close. So we arbitrarily start by first computing the sign and we will assign that to the variable set2 by saying set2 is sign of set0. So we have a dependency of set2 on set0. Then the variable set3 shall be the addition of set0 and set1. So here we have a dependency on two variables and we will store that in a new temporary variable. And then we have set4 which will be the multiplication of set two and set three. So it depends on two intermediary variables. And then the result of the function will just be the last entry in this compute graph. We can derive the symbolic derivative. So this is what we're going to use to benchmark against by just taking the gradient. So we have two inputs, so we have two partial derivatives and we can compute the gradient for that. Let's get started with coding. The first thing I want to implement is the functions themselves without necessarily using this explicit compute graph representation. So you will say def f of x0 comma x1 is just return numpy dot sign on x0 multiplied with x0 plus x1. So this is the straightforward implementation of that function. Then we can also implement its analytical derivative. So let's call this f gradient, which is x0 and x1 again as its inputs. And then it returns a numpy array. So return numpy.array of two components. So first the derivative with respect to x0, which will be numpy.cosine of x0 multiplied with x0 plus x1 plus numpy dot sign of x0. And then the derivative with respect to x2 will just be numpy dot sign of x0. Let's shift enter that so that we have that at our disposal. And now I want to trace or manually trace that function into a compute graph as we already have it up here. And then call this the compute graph. So this is associated with the function f. And this is a list of operation. And each entry in the list is a tuple with two entries. And the first entry is a string indicator of what it does. And the first operation shall be an input operation. And then it should have a second entry, which tells us the indices within the compute graph it depends on. So the input of the zero of node depends on zero. And maybe also to make this bit better to understand. I will just add a comment here that this is the zero node in the compute graph. So this is essentially the set zero. And then we have something similar for the set one. So we will have input again and then dependency on one this time. And here let's add the comment one 
And then we have the first actual computation. So we decided to have the first computation being the sign. We could have also done the addition, but here this is a little bit arbitrary and we opted for doing the sign. So there we do sign and this sign is a function that only has one dependency. So, or it depends only on one argument. And so we only need one index here. And this shall be zero because we take the sign of x zero and x zero was an input, which is at position zero. And now we have to say, well, this depends on that particular line or whatever the result of that line is, but an input operation does not change the input, obviously. Okay, so this gives us two. Next, we have the addition. And the addition is the first operation that takes two inputs. And let's look at our compute graph. So it depends on set zero and set one. So we will set its inputs at zero comma one. And this gives then set three. And then ultimately we will have a multiplication which takes the result of the sign as well as the result of the addition. So it depends on two comma three. And then this gives us the fourth entry or depending on how you count, we have five entries of course, but four is the index here. Okay, that's our compute graph. Now we need to inform what these operations do. And we will do this twice. So first we will do a way where we only assign a primal computation to it. So what you would also have if you implemented this very similarly in Python. And then the second library we will do later is related to the automatic differentiation. So let's first do the primal library. And I want to call this the fun library or the function library, or maybe to make it more fun or less fun, let's just have it fn. And this shall be a dictionary. So we use the curly braces and the keys shall be strings that we then can index with the operation string that we have here. So the first thing we have is the input operation. And here then I will just use a lambda function. So you'll say this is lambda x being x. So this is just the identity. An input should not modify the input. Then we have a sign, which is lambda x numpy dot sign of x. Then we have addition, which takes now two inputs. So lambda x comma y and returns x plus y. And then ultimately we have the multiplication with lambda x comma y returning x multiplied with y. This is the fun library. And we can now use the fun library, the compute graph to define a function which operates or executes the compute graph. And let's just directly call it compute. It takes a graph, a compute graph, and it also requires inputs. So the inputs show be the particular values at which we want to evaluate the compute graph. And then let me create a values list and say that this values is a list of the inputs. So what we want to have or how I would imagine that is that we provide the inputs as a tuple. So with the tuple being as long as we have a number of inputs. And then with list, we turn the tuple into a list. And then basically this values list shall represent the indices in the compute graph. So right now we have the first two entries they are already because those are the inputs. And now the task of this compute function is to add the entries to the list. And this is exactly what we're going to do. So we will say for operation comma indices in graph. So this requires the compute graph to be of that particular format that it has a tuple in each entry consisting of the operation string and the indices this operation depends on. And then we will just loop over it. Since we already have the inputs in our list of values, we will just continue or skip that iteration. So we will say if operation is equal to input, then we will just continue. But if this is no longer the case, so when we then actually come to a point where some computation happens, we want to execute that computation. For this, we first need to resolve the arguments and call this args. And for this, we will use a list comprehension in that we say values indexed at index for index in indices. So what happens here? So indices again was a tuple and we will iterate over all the values in the tuple which are integer indices. 
And then we will access the values list at that particular position and then create a list of arguments. And these are the concrete values of arguments. So for instance, in the operation of the sign, it depends on zero. We will loop over this tuple with only one element, which is zero, and then extract the values list at that particular position. And then we basically have an args list, which also again has only one element, but is now the concrete value we have. So ultimately, it will then become the first input of the inputs. Okay, then we can compute the result by calling the fun library and saying fun library at operation. So this is indexing the dictionary at the particular operation string, and then apply this to the args. But we have to be careful. So args is now a list, and we can unpack the list with an asterisk, meaning that now if there's more than one argument to this function, this will be correctly placed at the right position. And now having the result, we can then append it to the values. So values.append result. And then ultimately, we go through the entire loop. And then we return the last entry in the values list. So that means whatever is the last entry will be the output of the compute graph. Here we implicitly assume that our compute graph always ends in one output. And we will also only have this one output being a scalar. But of course, you can arbitrarily extend that. Let's shift enter that function. And then we can finally use it to evaluate and see if our compute graph actually is consistent with the function that we directly implemented in Python. For this, let's create a sample input and say that this is a tuple with the entries 0.6 and 1.4. Then let's first evaluate the original function f at that tuple. So we will say f evaluated at the unpacked tuple. So again, we will use the asterisk to unpack the tuple such that our input or the function f, which takes the signature of, of two scalar arguments, is fulfilled. And then we get this numeric value. And then similarly, let's call compute on the compute graph together with the sample input. And we see it produces the exactly same result. And not, not only until a couple of steps after the comma, but for the entire precision of that particular double floating operation. And that's very cool. I mean, essentially, the same operations took place. It's just that we manually created this compute graph. Sometimes you also refer to these particular compute graphs as Vanguard list that goes back to a publication by Vanguard in the 50s. And of course, the way we do it right here is a very static way. So we have to first define the compute graph and then execute it. Modern deep learning and automotive frameworks are way more flexible with that. So they kind of allow to dynamically build a compute graph, like for instance in PyTorch, or they allow you a function to trace another function to create a compute graph out of it, like Jax does it. But essentially, as mentioned, I believe that it, the internal representation of compute is very similar to what we have here. Now it's time for automatic differentiation. We want to compute the derivative of our just created compute graph. And this requires two things. So we need to extend our function library to automatic differentiation primitive rules that tell us how to differentiate that respective function. And the second part is we also need a slightly different evaluation of the compute graph that makes usage of this newly created library. So let's start with this library. And for this, I want to no longer use lambdas because they are a little bit longer functions and instead have all the different functions of the automatic differentiation routines implemented as separate functions, you can derive these functions. And whenever we come across one function, I will have a video linked up here on a derivation for this particular operation in case you want to check that or learn that in more detail. Okay, let's start. First, we need the backprop rule for the input operation. So define input and let's call this backprop rule or reverse rule. Automatic differentiation, unfortunately, has a lot of conflicting terminology. Here, we will use backprop. Um, but probably more names are out in the wild. And whenever we define a backprop rule, I want to follow a, somehow a little bit of a Julia spirit in that we use closure functions to represent reverse rules. And so that we have a function which takes the primal input, so what we also had in the forward computation, and then produces two outputs, the primal output. So this is what also our function library did together with a pullback closure function that 
computes given a cotangent output the cotangent input will make sense in a second so this takes primal input x and then the input very straightforward we say that z is x so z shall denote the output variable of that particular elementary function then we would define a closure pullback so let's say def input pullback and this one takes a cotangent output so it requires us to have a set cotangent and then it should back propagate the cotangent back to the x space and for the input since it is just the identity operation we have that x cotangent is set cotangent and then it returns x cotangent but it does not directly return it but returns it as a tuple and this will make sense in a second so Right now, we only have one return and we pack it into a tuple of length one. This concludes the closure function and then the backprop rule shall return set together with the input pullback. That's what I meant. So it returns the primal output together with this closure function. Next rule is on the sign. So we define the sign backprop rule on x and set. Primal computation is applying the sign to x. And now let's define the pullback. So we will do sign pullback and this one takes a set cotangent again and it produces the x cotangent by saying numpy.cosine applied to x. So it uses the cosine on x multiplied with set cotangent. Again, if you want more details, I have the video linked up here. We return x cotangent again in a tuple and then ultimately the function returns set together with the sign pullback function. Next rule we need to implement is the add. So add backprop rule. And this one takes x and y. So it takes two inputs and then first produces the output by adding them up. And then we have the add pullback. And now how many inputs does the pullback take? So it takes as many inputs as we have outputs of the primal operation. So the primal only produces a scalar so we also only get a scalar here with set cotangent. But since the pullback takes as many inputs as we have outputs of the primal, it returns as many outputs as we have inputs of the primal. So we have both an x and a y cotangent. However, it's very simple for the add operation because the cotangent just backpropagates to the two inputs identically. So we will have x cotangent being just set cotangent and y cotangent being also just set cotangent and now we return the tuple of x sorry x cotangent together with y cotangent so this now will be a tuple of length 2 this also represents that we have two inputs here okay then return again primal output which was set together with the pullback closure the final rule we need to implement and probably the most complicated in quotation mark is the multiplication back prop rule which also takes two inputs x and y produces set as x multiplied with y let me scroll down a bit and then the pullback operation so multiplication pullback takes the set cotangent and produces x cotangent by saying y multiplied with set cotangent and we have y cotangent is x multiplied with z cotangent. So in order to get the cotangent in x, we take the primal input in y and multiply it with the incoming cotangent and vice versa for the other cotangent. And we will then return x cotangent and y cotangent. And then we will return the primal output together with the closure function. Shift enter registers all the four functions. Let's also create a backprop library. So backprop library, and this is again a dictionary with the corresponding between the operation string and the correct backpropagation rule. So we have input using the input backprop rule. We will have sign using the sign backprop rule. We will have addition using the addition backprop rule. And then we have multiplication using the multiplication backprop rule. Shift enter executes that. With the backprop library down, we can then start implementing 
reverse mode automatic differentiation and we will do it in form of the primitive of the vector Jacobian product that traverses our compute graph and then combines all the backprop rules in order to create a big backprop rule, you might say. And then we can build some sugar code around that in order to obtain the gradient. So let's define the vector Jacobian product based on the graph and the inputs. And then it consists of two phases. So first we have a forward phase where we traverse the graph forwardly and then reversely. But while we do it forwardly, in, instead of executing the primary function, we will execute the functions from the backprop library and we will thereby save the pullback. So we will first create again this values list from the inputs. So values on inputs. And we will also create a pullback stack which is an empty list for now in which we are going to append the pullback operations. Almost similar to the compute graph forward operation, we do for operation comma indices in graph and we will again skip if the operation is an input. So if operation equals equals input, then we will just continue. We will first compute the arguments by using the list comprehension of saying values indexed at index for index in indices. Then we will compute the result and we will compute the pullback function from the backprop library accessed at the operation and evaluated at the arcs. And we again use the asterisk for tuple unpacking. We will append the result to the values so values.append result and we will append the pullback function to our pullback stack. So append pullback function. But here we have to be careful again because we cannot only append the pullback function to the stack, but we also need to know where the indices come, came from again. So we will actually have the pullback stack being a list of two pulls where the first argument is the pullback function and the second is the indices where the primal inputs came from. This will also make sense in a second. Okay, this is the forward pass. Maybe we can also add a comment here. So this is the forward pass. And then I want to again create a closure function which performs the reverse operation for us. And let's call this the pullback. And this one takes an output cotangent because when we had the primal operation, so let's look at the compute function again, we returned the last value. And now this pullback closure that we are also going to return as part of the VJP transformation will take or require us to define the output cotangent. So this is basically the cotangent at which we want to start the reverse mode. We will also later see that this will just be 1.0 to get a derivative. Then what does the pullback do? So first it allocates an array of numbers in which we can save in cotangent values. And this shall be as long as our values list is long. So we will do numpy dot zeros of length being the length of values. So each node in our compute graph can have multiple parents. And when we go through it reversely, we need to add up contributions that come in reversely. So we will allocate this at zero and constantly update it if a certain particular node in the graph gets updated with additional cotangent value. And then we can also start the operation by saying cotangent at minus one being the output cotangent. And then we go reversely through the compute graph so let's say the following for i comma pullback function comma indices in enumerate reversed pullback stack. So the pullback stack was this list going forwardly. We will reverse it to go reversely, obviously, and then we will enumerate it in order to know where we are in a reverse ordering. And then basically with this i, we can find out where we are in our current cotangent values. So let's also find the current cotangent, so current cotangent value. And this will be essentially the input to the pullback functions that we created in our library. And in order to get that, we will say cotangent values accessed at minus one 
minus i. So minus i is that we access it reversely because it has the later cotangent values towards its end. And then we need the minus one because of indexing in Python, if we directly indexed it at minus zero, which would be the first iterate, this would actually not work. So it would give us wrong values. So we have minus one minus i. So this is the current cotangent value. And then we plug this current cotangent value in the current pullback function to get back the cotangent arguments. So cotangent args is the pullback function applied to the current cotangent value because in the forward pass we had this args. So args was basically collecting in a list all the concrete values that we will then feed into the operation. And now we are going reversely and now we found the corresponding cotangent values. And now it probably makes sense why we needed to save the indices because we now need the indices together with the respective values to distribute this cotangent information backward in the compute graph. So we will say for index comma cotangent in sip of indices comma cotangent arcs and then we will say cotangent values at index is plus equal cotangent and this is important that we have a plus equal here because in contrast to the forward operation where if we create a new entry in our or compute a new level in our compute graph we will never change it so it will never be overwritten again. Whereas here, when we go reversely through the compute graph, since we can have very long range dependencies or we can have one node being dependent on more than one input, so as we had it for the multiplication and addition, then we need to distribute back the cotangent information to the corresponding location. And so that's the reason we started at zero and we then add up so that we get all this accumulated. Okay, so this is what the pullback function does, has two nested loops here. And then ultimately, once it has computed all the cotangent values, we are only interested in the cotangent values that are in the inputs or at the input positions. And then we can return them and say, return cotangent values indexed at colons, so basically up to the length of inputs. So here in our case, we had two inputs. The entire cotangent values was a NumPy array with five entries because we had five levels in our compute graph. However, out of these five, only the first two are inputs. And so those are the only ones we are interested in automatic differentiation because we don't want the intermediate cotangent representation. Okay, so this is the pullback closure. Then for the VJP, we can return the primal output so the primal output will again be values indexed at minus one. So this is that list here we had. And then we also return the pullback. Shift enter registers that function. So let's use this VJP function. So we will say VJP on our particular compute graph together with the sample input. And then, then this returns obviously two things. So first it returns an out value and I want to call this a back value or a back function maybe. Let's call it a back function. Let's look at these two outputs individually. So first let's look at out. Hmm, that looks familiar. So this should be exactly the same numeric value as we also had up here. And on the first glimpse it looks like that. And then this back, if we take a look at it, so if we take a look at back, we see it is a function here and we can execute that function as this function here, requiring us to define an output cotangent, which is 1.0, because whenever you do reverse mode auto diff and you contract into one scalar value, you can get the gradient by applying it or applying the VJP function to 1.0. And if we do so, we now get an array. How nice. Is this array the same as the gradient? Let's check. Let's do f gradient applied to the unpacked sample input and we see, nice, it is actually the same array. So our reverse mode automatic differentiation seems to be working correctly. Let's define some sugar coating around the VJP function and call this the value and cred function or value and cred operation, which basically takes a graph together with inputs and then it computes out and back function by VJP on the graph together with its inputs. And then we will get the gradient 
by saying back function applied to 1.0 and we will return out and cred. And we can call this value in cred function on our compute graph together with the sample inputs. And then we will get the primal output together with the gradient. And this also highlights how reverse mode automatic differentiation works. You always get the primal for free. So I mean, sometimes you don't need it. If you're only interested in a gradient, then of course you could just define a function cred, which totally ignores out or this output value. However, oftentimes, especially in optimization cases, it can be definitely interesting to also record the loss if you compute towards a scalar loss. And so you essentially get that for free. And let's call our analytical functions similarly to also produce this tuple output. For this, we will say f evaluated at unpacked sample input and f cred evaluated at unpacked sample input. And then we see here we then get the same output as with our reverse mode AD end. This channel is supported by Pasteur Labs and the Institute for Simulation Intelligence. Click the link in the video description to find out more how they merge machine learning and simulation in order to reimagine the scientific method. Also a big thanks to all my Patreons. If you also want to support my vision of free education on advanced mathematical topics, you find the link to the Patreon page down in the video description. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, then please leave a like and consider subscribing to the channel. There is more content on automatic differentiation. For instance, these primitive rules you saw earlier in the video. Here you will now see similar videos and I hope to see you in one of the next videos.